We're going to move on um, to type 2 diabetes, and our next speaker is um, uh, Dr. Ryan Paul, who's an endocrinologist at Fatuara in Waikato and the University of Waikato. Um, he's an executive member of the NZSSD and has been leading the development of national guidelines for the management of type 2 diabetes. Um, he is going to be talking today about technology and best care for type 2 diabetes and how do we fare in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So thank you very much, uh, Ryan. There might be Jeremy's list that's just gone. Um, but kia ora, Rosemary, and um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for the invite um, to talk at the symposium. I'd like to echo Neil's words that I hope the words here um, diffuse out from these walls um, to get the change that we need. Here are my disclosures. I wear many hats, um, many roles, but none are really relevant um, to this talk. Um, we're getting used to Leonard Thompson's um, face very well, and as Ben has outlined, he did die at the age of 27. In fact, our stats that Ben showed in terms of life expectancy for children now with type 1 diabetes are closer to that of Sweden than other countries. And you only have to go across the ditch um, to Jenny's home now and they'll live four years longer. That was pre-technology and that gap's only going to get wider every day until we start closing that. I think one thing we don't or appreciate, it was underappreciated, is that the prognosis now for our, our tamariki and rangatahi with type 2 diabetes is now far worse than that for type 1 diabetes. And that, you know, Jim spoke about it was only 35 years ago that people realised for insulin for type 2 diabetes. Well, when someone's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, on average they've already lost about half their beta cells. So the cells that produce insulin. And then generally, or typically over the next 10 to 15 years, they lose the rest of the beta cells for mechanisms that we don't really fully appreciate. And basically, if you live long enough with type 2 diabetes, you will need insulin. In fact, roughly about a third of New Zealanders with type 2 diabetes are on insulin at present. You could probably argue a lot more should be um, that aren't. Um, but it is roughly a third. And as I said, the prognosis for our young people with type 2 diabetes isn't great. So at present, um, we roughly have 300,000 New Zealanders with type 2 diabetes. That may be a slightly high, higher figure than you used to, but we do know our virtual diabetes register misses at least 5% of patients. And we also know from COVID uh, there are many tens of thousands of New Zealanders that weren't in a practice, and they're literally likely far more than 300,000 um, amongst us. What's more scaringly, um, as Jim also hinted to, there's over a million um, New Zealanders with pre-diabetes, um, which isn't a benign disease in its own right, and they're well on the way um, to obviously developing diabetes. Everyone in this room and online is well aware that diabetes is a major risk factor in terms of you know, four of our cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease and renal disease. In fact, two-thirds of those with diabetes will die um, cardi cardiovascular disease. But something that's also underappreciated is the effect that diabetes has on basically every other health disorder. Um, yeah, particularly cancers, you know, fractures, mental health. It's all of it. In fact, one in five New Zealanders are in hospital either directly or indirectly because of their diabetes. And, you know, we should never forget that in a time where the health system is struggling. And, you know, Minister Clark also spoke about the cost. You know, we came out from, from that report um, that many of us in this room put together. You know, it's over $2 billion already, and that cost is just going to increase exponentially um, with time. It's also been hinted at that type 2 diabetes creates some of our largest inequities in Aotearoa, New Zealand. In fact, we know that you know, Māori are at least almost twice as likely to develop type 2 diabetes. It comes on decades earlier and creates you know, a great burden of disease. And that results in Māori being you know, four times at least more likely ending up on dialysis and at least one and a half times more likely to die from, from cardiovascular disease and, and cancers. What's tragic is that the successive governments have known this since the 1960s and nothing's changed, um, particularly over the last 25 years and that the risks do not appear to be due to being Māori or Pacific themselves. It's not ethnicity related. It's largely driven around access to care, including socioeconomic deprivation, so it's modifiable. I uh, really want you know, that message to be taken home. And what's even worse, I guess, for this, you know, in terms of these figures, is that Māori probably do the best out of all of our Pacific whanau. It's, it's worse for our other Pacific peoples. Um, and this is the challenge that we face. So despite that burden, um, that cost and the inequities, I, mean, I think personally it was, it's heartbreaking that there's no specific diabetes action plan. Many of us in this room were involved in the development of one, which was canned. 
You could argue we should celebrate um, that diabetes is in um, Te Pai Tata, or our interim health plan. It's amongst five, or four, there are four other conditions. Pretty much they're all related to diabetes and obesity themselves. Um, and a 57 page document, you know, all we get is a paragraph around diabetes. And our only real action um, in a day or days we're famously trying to reduce postcode lotteries is an intervention program in one region of the country. Albeit it's a high risk, you know, high need area, but the whole country needs intervention for diabetes, not just South Auckland. So how do we fare in terms of best care? And I'll incorporate technologies as part of this and just take a quick uh, walk through, through really the whole journey um, with, with type 2 diabetes. So we'll start with prevention and screening. So we all know that obesity is our greatest risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes, but as well as having no diabetes action plan, there's no action plan for obesity. In fact, we're one of the few developed countries worldwide who do not define obesity as a disease. It meets all the criteria. It's no surprise, you know, us, Australia, United States, where we blame patients for their disease is the ones that are doing the worst. You know, other countries have realised where that blame should lie, and I think we need to do that in Aotearoa, New Zealand as well. And we've heard a lot, I guess, during Diabetes Action Month, um, which we're, we're still in, um, about that social stigma around diabetes and obesity. Diabetes isn't sexy, but we also know that, you know, we need to act on that. There's a lot we need to do in that space and for advocacy, which is part of the reason why it's great to be here today. Um, one, of the, one of the few bright spots of this talk um, is that we do very well for screening for diabetes compared to other parts of the world. And that's largely through the cardiovascular risk assessments that start at approximately the age of 35 for those at a greatest risk. But we're still missing a whole long young age group, you know, a tamariki and rangatahi with, with diabetes. We should be screening from the age of 10. And we have started guidance around that, really to try and help capture in, in that age group because they are so high risk. One thing you may also not appreciate um, for all of us in the room is that our diagnostic criteria for diabetes is different to the rest of the world. Our HbA1c cutoff is 50, um, where for the rest of the world you know, is, is 48 on a mile per mole. There's, there's literally another 30 or 40,000 New Zealanders who would meet the criteria for diabetes if we shifted it. One thing that was, this, you know, we brought up in discussions about reducing it, but we're struggling and you know, we're drowning in terms of resources at the moment and just the impact that we'll have. Just, just be aware, you know, the impact of diabetes is far greater, you know, than the numbers we put up here on, on our slides. Um, part of, though, you could argue is screening. If you're going to screen for any condition, you need to have a good intervention in terms of treating that, and we're not there, not there yet. Um, which will bring me to, I guess, the next slide. So lifestyle intervention, you know, for, for type 2 and for type 1, doesn't matter what form of diabetes, is always a cornerstone of management um, at all times. We know worldwide there are very good programs out there. In fact, if you read um, you know, the Edgar Health Diabetes Zen Report, you'll see the direct intervention spoken about. It's from the UK. It's a very pragmatic intervention rolled out by primary care. There's no reason why we couldn't do it here. Um, they've shown remission in at least a third of patients um, with type 2 diabetes at two years. So that's long-term remission. It's cost-effective. It's something that we could deliver here, because if we don't get reversal of type 2 diabetes, you're just going to see that gradual progression through no fault of the patient to end-stage diabetes. So, you know, that lack of no national intervention has been highlighted. Many regions, I'll say most regions, struggle for funding and to, you know, for, for their own interventions. We have a good, good one, the Wakato called Kimiora. It's shown to work, but it still struggles from our strategy and funding to get funding every year. And that's what we're fighting against. And I also say here, I think it's very important that at all stages we remain evidence-based. Um, you can get many people in a room and they argue about best lifestyle management for type 2 diabetes. But at the same time, I want to say that the best evidence is around Mediterranean plant-based diets, not keto diets and intermittent fasting. In fact, they actually lack any conclusive evidence um, two years or further. And it's about really trying to get best-based care, not just in terms of what's a fad um, at, at the moment. So move on to, I guess, medications or, or glucose-lowering therapies. So Ben showed that, you know, roughly, or maybe Ben Jenny, sorry, that, or showed that, you know, less than um, a, basically a fifth of patients um, with type 1 diabetes aren't meeting targets. It's not much better for type 2 diabetes, um, despite arguably being, being far easier um, to achieve. 
um, with, with the right um, medications. If you read every guideline in the world, um, virtually all promote metformin as first line therapy um, for all patients with type 2 diabetes. We're roughly only about 60% of our patients in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, with that. Um, you know, part of the argument's been around side effects. Extended release metformin, which greatly reduces the side effects, is literally as cheap as chips or dirt, um, but we don't have it here. Um, similarly, um, a lot of today is celebrating insulin. Um, all guidelines pretty much recommend the introduction of insulin with HPNC greater than 90, because they won't reach targets without it. As I mentioned before, we're roughly about a third um, of patients meeting that. And that's not through the fault of the, um, the patients. If we extrapolate data somewhat, we know roughly about three quarters of these patients had the same HPNC a year ago. They've picked up all their scripts in the meantime. They've had at least five or six contacts with the health system. It's the health system that we need to do, need to do better here for them. So we did celebrate. It was great that we had the arrival of Trulicity and Jardians um, last year. They are relative game changers. They're not complete magic bullets, but they are fantastic tools in the armory. They do reduce cardiovascular disease and renal disease independently of the effect of the glucose levels. So that's part of the reason why we're excited. And they do not cause hypoglycemia alone and typically lead to weight loss, which most of our patients um, you know, need. What is though, you know, we did celebrate, um, but we've been screaming out for these for a long time. In fact, GLP run receptor agonists have been available for approximately 17 years worldwide. These agents aren't new. They've, you know, they've been present elsewhere for a long time, but we've finally got them. Um, but we've still got restrictions around that, including we can't use both through the city and Jardians in combination for our high risk patients when we know it will, you know, significantly reduce their burden of cardiovascular disease and renal disease. And we're probably going to have big problems next year, um, just with a sole supplier, and that, we're, and that we have to look for alternative um, GLP-1 receptor agonists. So now specialist care, which I think does have still a key role in management of type 2 diabetes, even though the majority is, is managed in, in the community. Part of that are dietitians. In fact, they're a gold standard of management of type 2 diabetes at every stage. In fact, guidelines will recommend for every 300 patients you have with diabetes, you should have a dietitian. Um, basically, we're over, you know, we're struggling to get one dietitian for every 3,000 um, patients. And most patients in, with, throughout Aotearoa will not actually qualify to see a dietitian. It's even worse for psychologists, and we know how much mental health has an impact, and also for podiatry. We shouldn't forget, you know, podiatrists in there. We're really short of podiatrists in, the, in our country. Um, even for those with moderate foot disease, struggle um, to see a podiatrist. You know, what's scary, um, you know, it's great that most of those with type 1 diabetes will have access to a specialist, um, but it's estimated that approximately 95% of those with type 2 diabetes that have laser treatment for their eye disease or end up on dialysis for their kidney disease never see a diabetes specialist at any point. Um, there's also, you know, for those that are very high risk for type 2 diabetes, such as you know, our young adults, they will even struggle to see a specialist team. So it's really about trying to paint an you know, objective picture. It's not, it's not a rosy picture, it's an objective picture of, of how we fare. Part of access to specialist care, I think, is access to policy makers, um, which is great um, why I guess we're in Parliament um, today. Um, we did have a diabetes leadership group. That's unfortunately been disbanded within the ministry. Um, there's also, a, it's a massive, actually, um, lack of decent data for the, for the Te Whata Ora and Takafai Ora to work with. We do have that I guess that data available within each region, and it's really think the, it highlights the importance of having clinical specialists in, involved in, in policy making. Um, in fact, often I will say often the failures of diabetes care has been blamed on on healthcare providers. Um, but I think I think it's important to realise that the feedback from those on on the coal face has largely been ignored um, for decades, um, and that there is it's probably true for everything um, in health and, and elsewhere, but there is marked middle bureaucracy which is stifling diabetes care. Nothing taught us, more, you know, COVID taught us a lot, but nothing, you know, taught us more that health providers and communities know what they need. That rings very true for diabetes. 
this is what we need to do in terms of em empowering our providers and communities to get there, and also having accountability. Now we've watched those inequities widen and twiddle our thumbs, and no one's been held accountable. Now, I'll mention how grave and concerning you know, a lack of our action plans is. We've lost generations, we can't afford to lose more generations. So part of now technologies, which is obviously an important part of today and, and has a role to play. We're going back to basic um, technologies, glucometers or blood glucose meters. You'll all be used to them. Now, patients with type 2 diabetes can only qualify for funding if they're on insulin or sulfonylureas. Yet they have an important role for everyone, you know, particularly when they're sick um, and they're all unwell. We've got Jardiance. Um, one risk, a significant adverse effect of Jardiance is, is diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA. Everywhere else in the world you have access to funded ketone meters or your Kersen's dual meter. We don't have that here, which is probably one of the, we've got the highest risks of real world DKA um, compared to others. Type 2 diabetes is very different to insulin pump therapy, uh, different, different to type 1 diabetes. There's, there's very different needs. So those, just to be aware, there's no clear role at present for pump therapy, um, including automated therapy in those with type 2 diabetes. But there is a clear role for, for CGM. But it is different, and then not all patient groups with type 2 diabetes would likely benefit from um, CGM, but we know that there's very strong cost-effective analysis for those on insulin with type 2 diabetes will benefit. Um, I know we've been harbouring on to Pharmac in terms of, I, I personally I do feel sorry for Pharmac from one aspect, is that they have to show that, you know, for, to fund, they need to show benefits within their drug dispensing budget. All the evidence around CGM is around, I guess, savings for the health system. We actually know it saves money. For us, we know it's a no-brainer, but it needs to come out of a different budget unless they're funded differently. And this is, I guess, part of what we have to, um, to work through. And also realising that CGM can be a you know, very powerful educational tool when used appropriately, even though for those that aren't on um, insulin. And what's been said, I guess, with that lack of funding, is that many practices and PHOs or primary healthcare organisations have to buy CGM themselves, which has actually taken money away from care elsewhere to try and deliver the care that we need to do for diabetes. And this is what we need to, need to stop. Just sort of show you quickly, this is one study that we're doing. Um, Ben's involved as well, it's nationwide, but primarily in, in the Waikato, of what you can do with CGM and um, specialist input. These were only diabetes nurses um, reviewing every few weeks. And within six months, you have taken those that were, you know, termed the, on insulin, that were termed the hardest to, to reach, and with a mean HbA1c, sort of around about 88 or 10% or in the old language, and through very limited contact, we've got them down to an HbA1c, um, sort of sitting around about 7.5. Um, so we're, we're getting there. Um, but it shows what can be done remotely with just, you know, minor input um, and with CGM. You also see those, so those in the blue is actually those that were on finger prick. So you can even show with, you know, we may not necessarily have all the, the magic tools, but even just with finger prick and input, we can get there. This is also, I guess, local data, and I just really want to, I won't go into this in much detail, I know time's coming to a close, but Māori in blue, orange, um, Pacific and orange, and um, basically non-Māori, non-Pacific uh, in grey. And this just shows different access to medications. And what we've done in, in the Waikato, this is actually data from a couple of months ago, we're a lot better now, but there are now no inequities in access to medications. Okay, it's been a lot of work. I'd like to big sing out to my primary care team, um, including Kathy, Suzanne, and Elizabeth, um, and Joe Scott Jones as well. It's about we've got you know developed real time data. Um, there's been prioritisation of care. There's been target education, you know, pragmatic guidance, and just working hard. Um, we're struggling for funding, yet we have achieved massive milestones. In fact, roughly about half of our patients with type two diabetes in the Waikato have now met their target in terms of target HP on C less than 53. So it shows just what can, be, what can be done. So in conclusion, I just really want to say that type 2 diabetes, we shouldn't forget it today. I know a lot of the discussion has been around type 1 diabetes, but it is important for insulin. It creates some of our largest inequities um, in our country. We're lacking the basic fundamentals of care. Um, it's urgently required. It's a very different group to those with type 1 diabetes, but it's still equally um, important. And I just want to say that, that we can do it. You know, it's just about empowering 
um, not only patients, that's always going to remain important, but also health professionals um, and communities as well. Um, but tēnā thank you for listening.